for the next session, we want to talk a little bit about um, some of the analytics tools that we've created within Odyssey, of which we're very proud. Um, but just to give you a little bit of an intro into what other people and me will be talking about, um, we have been talking this morning already about this journey from the patient level data to the reliable evidence. Um, and already mentioned by Peter and others, um, in Odyssey, we've decided to put this common data model in the middle. And I think this is a very important thing to do because even though for every data source, the journey from that data source to the common data model might be very unique and very different, when we get to that point from there on, from the CDM to the reliable evidence, we can actually have a standardized approach. We can have an approach that is shared across everybody. And so we can all take that journey from the CDM to the reliable evidence together. And so what shape does that journey take? So the first one is, well, we can just write code. Like we, we tend to uh, standardize on, on uh, R but you could also use SAS or, or SQL or, or other code. You can just write your own code if you're doing a study against the CDM to get the evidence that you want. And so that will be 100% custom. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And because of the CDM, the nice thing is once you've done that once for one database, uh, you can share that code with other databases and they can uh, use that same code. So you're, you're already having advantage of the CDM. But of course, because there is now a large number of, of databases available in the CDM uh, that, that um, you can rely on, it actually um, um, pays off to, to build tools that are uh, usable across all these sites. And so one thing that we've done is we've created a large set of R packages, which we call the Odyssey Methods Library. And so these are uh, basically libraries of functions that you can call uh, some of them uh, do very simple things and other do very complicated things. Like if I wanted to, um, if I had a, a cohort that I was interested in, with a single function call, I could create a very large set of features for that cohort. And with a second function call, I for, could, for example, create a propensity model or a prediction uh, model uh, just like that. And so that allows me to very quickly uh, create uh, studies that answer questions uh, with a bit of customization, but also using uh, a lot of standard uh, code that is available in the Odyssey Methods Library. Last but not least, we've built this interactive analysis platform that we call Atlas, and we'll be showing you uh, a little bit more about that later, uh, where everything is standardized, uh, and where basically with a point and click interface you can define your study. And so those two, last two, the, the, uh, the library of R packages and Atlas are actually not independent, so they're not completely uh, isolated uh, tracks. They actually interact quite heavily. So some of the more complicated uh, compu computations that are done uh, in Atlas are actually, uh, in the background, executed by the R libraries. And from within R, you can interact with, uh, with some of the features that are available in Atlas as well. So just as an example uh, to, to show you what these tools can do, we'll, we'll be showing you um, evidence that can be generated around hypertension. So hypertension is a prevalent disease, uh, and it's a leading risk factor for many health outcomes. Uh, there are many alternative treatments available, many different classes. Uh, you can go for, for monotherapy or combo therapy. Each of those uh, treatments has uh, multiple potential effects, of course, uh, some of them are intended, they are intended to reduce the risk of acute myocardial infarction, and some of them are unintended or adverse uh, reactions. For example, some of these drugs actually increase the risk of angioedema. Uh, hypertension treatments have been extensively studied in uh, clinical trials, and the question, of course, is, well, what can we learn additionally from real-world data? And so, as already been alluded to several times this morning, we... we tend to categorize the evidence that we generate in Odyssey in three buckets. The first one is clinical characterization, and so Anthony Senna will be uh, showing you some of the tools we have for, for that particular type of evidence. Uh, next, Jenna Reps will be talking about patient-level prediction, so answering the question, what will happen to me? Um, and I will come back to the stage and tell you a little bit about the tools that we've developed for uh, population-level effect estimation, where we're trying to do causal inference. And so with that, I'd like to invite Anthony. Thanks, Martin. 
So I'm going to talk today about using Atlas for doing clinical characterization and some of the standardized analytics that we've built into the tools. Um, to start, we need to think about who it is that we want to characterize, and that starts off by defining the cohorts within Atlas that we would like to study. So within Atlas, we're making a series of choices in how we want to define the population of interest. So since we're going to be focused on hypertension, I'm going to start by defining a cohort of new users of ACE inhibitors. So at the top, you can see that we've created a criteria for finding the first drug exposure to an ACE inhibitor in the patient's history. We also require a 365-day look back to have reasonable assurance that we found the first ACE inhibitor exposure in their history. Once we've anchored on this criteria, we want to then define some other refinement criteria to make sure that we are, in fact, studying the hypertension patients of interest. So at the bottom here, we have three inclusion criteria, the first of which is we require a hypertension diagnosis in the year prior to starting an ACE inhibitor. The second is we want to make sure that we are looking at um, naive users of uh, ACE inhibitors. So we then look from that point backwards to make sure that there are no other hyper hypertensive uh, drugs that are being taken by this patient. And then lastly, we're going to make sure that they're on a monotherapy of ACE inhibitors. So we're going to look from that point of starting an ACE inhibitor uh, forward a bit to just make sure that that is the only hypertensive uh, drug that they are on. Uh, once we've defined this criteria, we need to evaluate it against patient-level data, and that's done through the tools using the Generation tab. As you can see at the top, we, ha we are um, fortunate within Janssen to have several data sets that have been converted to the OMOP common data model. And to execute this cohort definition against each of these CDMs, it's a matter of clicking the Generate button that appears to the left of each of the data sources. Once that's complete, you can then click on the View Reports button that's on the right to then bring up the report viewer that you see at the bottom. Might be a little hard to see, but I'm going to try and describe what's in that depiction above. So for the new users of ACE inhibitors, there's about 2.6 million people that start on an ACE inhibitor. But then when I apply my inclusion criteria, the attrition diagram that's just below shows how those inclusion criteria then further filter out the users based on the criteria I defined before. So we work from 2.6 million people down to about um, 1.9 million once we require the prior hypertension diagnosis, then further down to um, about 30%, 34% of those if we further exclude any users that may have had a hypertensive drug in their prior history. And then finally, once we require the monotherapy, we wind up at about 22% of the original number. So this is this, the cohort of people that we would want to make sure we've fully identified so we can use these criteria in an iterative process so that if we want to enforce other criteria and see the results, we can go back to the definition, add those criteria, rerun, and repeat until we are comfortable with the definitions that we have. We can then utilize Atlas to do um, cohort characterization. So we would like to understand the patient's baseline characteristics at the time that they started a drug. And within Atlas, we can choose one or more cohorts to use as inputs to characterize their baseline history. So in this example, I've created the cohorts of ACE inhibitor first-time monotherapy users, as well as thiazide diuretic users. And below that, we can pick standardized features in which we can use to characterize those cohorts. So we could do things such as, what are the demographics of people that start on an ACE inhibitor? Or what is the... Um, types of comorbid conditions that they have in the time prior to starting the drug. And we've created standardized time windows for those clinical events so that we can characterize things that are happening in a short-term time window, say 30 days, a medium or long-term time window, as well as all time prior. Within Atlas, it's a matter of making selections and choices to import the features that are of interest to you when you're characterizing your cohorts. When you finish that selection, you can move to generating. Just like I showed with the cohort definitions, you can generate this cohort across any, any data model, or sorry, any patient level data that's been converted to the OMOP CDM to produce plots and tables like this. So in this example here, I'm showing ACE inhibitor um, users. Within this first table, we're showing the year in which they started on an ACE inhibitor. If we work across, um, say, from 2006, we've got about 33,000 people. We provide a proportion of the folks in the cohort. And since I'm picking two cohorts in this example, I was also able to characterize the thiazide group in the same manner, as well as compute a standardized difference of mean, which gives me a, a measure of how different these two groups are of, with respect to this particular covariate. We then take these covariates 
and we can plot them on a, on a plot here. I'll just zoom in a little bit to make that hopefully a little easier to read. The 45 degree axis that you see on the dashed line would represent those covariates that are, uh, have a standardized difference of mean of zero, meaning that they are the same in both groups. And as you move further away from the 45 degree line, those that are more prevalent in say the ACE inhibitor group is going to move closer to the X axis, while if it's more prevalent in the thiazide group, it's gonna move more towards the Y axis. The plots within ATLAS are interactive so that when you see that there are differences between the populations, you can explore that data. You can hover over a particular um, data point to understand what, what covariate may be out of balance and maybe something that you need to consider either as part of your cohort definition or as part of your analysis strategy when you move further down to prediction and estimation. Another way that we can characterize these patients is by looking at their treatment pathways. So as George showed earlier, um, hypertensive patients have a number of options that they can start on. And in this example, what we've done is we've identified patients that are starting on any hypertensive therapy. We also did a few variations where we required that they started on a hypertensive medication but also had three years of follow-up so that we could understand their treatment patterns over that time, as well as you can also do further variations, like in this example, where we might also want to look at um, maybe patients that are starting on these drugs um, in a more proximal time frame to now, so we fil further filtered it to 2012. In the event cohorts, we can define events for drug exposures of interest, so you'll see in this list that we've created cohort definitions that represent exposures to the different hypertensive drugs that we're interested in so that we can understand how patients are moving through the different lines of therapies for this disease. Again, because it's been, this data has been converted to a common data model, we can carry out this analysis on one or more CDMs. And in this depiction, what we get back from a pathway analysis is um, nearly identical to what George showed earlier. You can imagine that the hypertensive patients are at the center of this sunburst plot here. And if you move to the first ring, this shows the proportion of patients and their first line therapies. You can see from this example, the first line therapy of ACE inhibitors is the largest proportion with ARBs and thiazides making up the second and thirds respectively. You can also see within this diagram that there are uh, instances where people are being given combination therapies. And so the pathways can collapse some of those groups together to recognize that there are times where people are getting combinations. Uh, if you continue along, you can move to the second and third layers to understand from ACE inhibitor first line, what are the second line therapies that people are using and what is the proportion of patients in those groups. Lastly, we can do incidence rate calculations through ATLAS. We've created a standard interface and analytic to compute incidence rates. The inputs to this uh, analysis require that you've defined your target cohorts of interest. So in this case, we're gonna look at new users of um, ACE inhibitors and thiazide diuretics again, since those were the most prevalent drugs used based on our pathway analysis. As Martine mentioned, these drugs are um, used to prevent acute MI but they can also carry the side effect of angioedema. And so we've defined outcomes for those um, events, and we've used those in the outcome cohorts above. As part of an instance rate, you have to think about the time at risk in which someone may uh, experience this outcome. And so ATLAS allows you to uh, decide on and choose your time at risk window, as well as uh, in the bottom here, we may want to further stratify our target populations based on different criteria. In this example, I've stratified based on gender, as well as the age over 65. And so again, it's a matter of carrying out the analysis against the common data model. When you run the incidence rate calculation through ATLAS, you're gonna be provided with some statistics for each target and outcome that you can view individually. As shown here, we ran this, data, um, we ran this analysis against one of our data sets, and we can get a count of cases uh, along with a proportion of, of people that experience the cases, as well as the total time at risk in years, and an accrued incidence rate. So this is unadjusted. This just gives you an idea of how many people are experiencing the outcome in the target population. As I mentioned before, we can also stratify uh, this incidence rate calculation. So you'll be able to see um, in a little bit more detail what are the subpopulations of interest that experience these outcomes. And then once you've gathered enough data and you feel that you've got it ready, 
you have a reasonable assurance that you can do a study with this target set of target populations and identify and uh, detect these outcomes of interest. And so once you've gone through these clinical characterization exercises through ATLAS, you've developed the standardized analytics as well as the standardized assets that are going to feed into the next set of processes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jenna, who's going to talk about how these feed into patient level prediction. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about how we actually are going to use, uh, well, go through the journey of patient level prediction. So there might be a point in time where you're given an ACE inhibitor, you have hypertension, and you want to know what's my risk of having a potential side effect angioedema, or maybe the drug doesn't work so well for you, so you end up having the acute myocardial infarction. Uh, and you want to see what your risk is within a year. So the characterization that, that Anthony just showed could give you the, the population risk, but maybe that's not good enough. Maybe you want to know what your personal risk is. So I'm going to go through the journey of using Atlas and our tools to answer this question. So if you go to Atlas and you actually have the option of picking this prediction on the left, it will then go up to an interface where you can design your prediction problem. So we've got here the target population. So this is the people you want to do the, the prediction for. And in this case, this would be ACE inhibitors who have hypertension, as, as Anthony just showed. And then you have your outcome cohorts, so the two outcomes that you want to predict. So this would be the angioedema and the MI. And then you've got the option of picking different analysis settings. So the first one will be the model setting that you want to use. So we're going to do a lasso logistic regression this example. But there's also a range of different algorithms that you can apply using Atlas. And there's actually even more. There's, there's deep learning and there's ensemble learning in the R package if you go outside of Atlas. And then we've got covariates. So we have standard covariates that are extracted when you run uh, any of the tools in, in Atlas. And we've picked some standard covariates that we're going to be using. And then we have our population settings. So this is when you want to do the prediction. So we're going to do one day from the cohort start date, which is the day you have the ACE inhibitor, all the way until 365 days after you have the ACE inhibitor. You have a few settings for when you actually want to develop the model in terms of how much you want to use as a holdout set, how much you want to use for the development set, and, and how many people you want to actually sample from if you have a big target population. Sometimes you can have millions of people in your target population, and maybe you, you don't want to wait uh, for, for hours to get results, you want to get some, some uh, quick model so you can actually sample in that case. Other times you might want to get the best model possible and you want to just include everyone in there. So once you've put these settings in, in a standardized way, you can then actually save the, the results and then you'd go to this utilities button. So this utilities button will then summarize all the predictions that you're going to want to run. So we've actually just got two predictions here, so the MI and the angioedemia uh, within a year of, the, of taking your first ACE inhibitor. You simply give this, this uh, a name, so you could put the demo prediction. And then you just press this download button. And this download button will then that use Atlas to create an R package that will go from extracting the data that you specified to developing the model that you specified, or, or models in this case, and then evaluating. And it also has a shiny interface where you can view your model. So you can actually see and like, inspect the model and see how well the model performs. So um, I'm going to skip to the shiny app now. So if you go to the shiny app, the first thing you would do, so this is generated in, in, Atlas, um, in the Atlas package once you've downloaded and run it. You'll then have two rows for the two different models that you've developed. So we've got the row one, which corresponds to the, the predicting the MI within one year of the ACE inhibitor. And then you have the row two, which corresponds to predicting the angioedema. And in the summary page, you're going to have uh, the, the performance on the test set. So you've got the errors of the curve performance. So that we were able to predict uh, MI within a year of ACE inhibitor with an error to curve of 0.76, which is pretty reasonable. We uh, also have the error under the precision recall plot. So this is a, a useful metric when your instance is low, uh, which we have in this case, because this will give you more of an insight in terms of the false positive rate, which might have some impact when you're actually applying the models. And then your T and your O count, this is on the test set. So this is the, the, the number of people we just use as a holdout for evaluating the model. And then for the angioedema, we see that we don't get quite as good as performance. We get a, a point. 6.5 performance. So it's not quite as, as, as easy to predict who's going to get the angioedema within a year of the ACE inhibitor. 
and the incidence is much lower. So on this, not only do we get the summary, we can also look back and see what settings we had. So if you click on the row, it will then populate the settings. So you can see we did a logistic regression. You can look at the population settings and you can look at covariate settings. So if you were looking at someone else's models in the Shiny app, you can see what they've picked for, for developing the model. And then you can also go to this performance option on the left. And this will then take you to a summary. So it will tell you the prediction question. So we're looking now at the prediction for the MI within one year. And you have a dashboard that tells you the operating characteristics. And the nice thing is this is, as Patrick was mentioned earlier, that a lot of the time you'll want to pick some threshold where you say anyone who has predicted risk greater than this threshold, we're going to assume has the MI. And people who, who don't have uh, the, the risk that's lower than that threshold, they're not going to have MI. And then using that classification, we actually get the operating characteristics. So at a threshold of 0 0.0048, uh, anyone who has a higher threshold than that or equal to, we would identify 83% of people, who, or approximately 84% of people who are going to end up having the MI within a year. Uh, but our specificity will, will be pretty low at 49%. So we could actually move this along and see what our operating characteristics are at a, at a higher value. This should be updating. Oh, it did update. So here we've got a sensitivity is, is a bit lower. Up, updated too quickly for me. Um, so uh, the sensitivity is a bit lower, but your specificity is higher. So this you can play around, and this might help you pick a threshold that would actually be useful for doing some intervention um, or identifying the high-risk population. And if you want to dig a little bit deeper into the performance, you can click on this discrimination, and this will, will create some rock plots and, and precision recall plots. So here we can see actually how well uh, the model is doing. So for the rock plot, if a model was, was, was rubbish and it was equivalent to predicting randomly, you would end up having uh, the rock plot equivalent to this, this diagonal line. Anything above this diagonal line is better than random, so you're able to do some discrimination. And the further away you are from this diagonal, the better you are at being able to discriminate who's going to get the outcome. So in this case, we had a re reasonable performance model. The precision recall plot is handy if you have the low incident rate because it will give you some insight in, in terms of the false positives. So we can see here this, this dashed red line is the actual incidence in the population. And then uh, the bit above, which is basically saying you could identify a group that has a higher risk, but it's the risk of the, of the group is still going to be pretty low. So you're going to have quite a high false positive rate with this model. And then you want to see, does the, the risk that the model's assigning me uh, actually, is, is it true? Is it going to, if, I, if it says I have a 10% risk, is this going to be correct? So you can look at the calibration. And the way we look at the calibration is we split the, the, the population into 10 different groups based on their risk. And then in each group, we calculate the average predicted risk. And then we also look at the observed risk in that group. We plot them. That's 10 dots. If they fit on the diagonal, it means that the predicted risk is matching the observed risk. And that's good. And in this case, we are actually matching it pretty well. So this, this model is, is reasonably calibrated. The demographic plot is very similar. But instead of splitting people up into 10 groups, we actually split them up into age and gender groups. And then we look at the observed risk, which is in, in the red line, and the expected risk, so the predicted risk, which is the blue line. And if they match, then it means that for all the demographics, for all the different age and gender groups, we're getting uh, a good calibration. And we, the nice thing is this model actually identified the trend that as you get older, your risk of the MI goes up, which makes sense. So you can see the performance, but maybe you actually want to look at what the model looks like. So if you go to the model bo button on the left, you can then actually see what, what model of variables came into the model. So what variables seem to be predictive of having the MI within a year. And then we have binary variables. So this would be um, age groups, certain whether you had the condition error in the last year, whether you had the drug in the last year. And we also have measurements. So these are just the plots of things that were contained in the model. And as uh, Anthony was saying earlier, anything above the diagonal means it's more common in people who have the outcome. Anything below the diagonal means it's less common in people who have the outcome. So we see that things for MI, if people have cardiovascular issues beforehand, then they're more likely to have the MI in the, in the following year. Interestingly, if they were female, they were less likely to have the MI. And then we get things like the measurement. We, we included the Charleston comorbidity index into the model. And we find that if, if you had the MI, you generally had a higher value of that. So the people who had the MI were, were generally sicker people. If you want to dig, die, have a deeper dig into this, you can actually go to the model table. So this will have all the covariates, not just the ones that are included into the model. So zero means it wasn't included in the model. Uh, if it had a value, it meant that that's the coefficient, so it was included in the model. And you have the outcome mean and the non-outcome mean. 
Uh, when we actually put this online, we remove sensitive data. So the, the, algorithm, the, the package that's created will automatically remove data, cell counts of, of less than the value that you specify. So this actually didn't occur in, in many people. Not many zero to four-year-olds had ACE inhibitors. Um, which is not surprising. So this actually is minus one, uh, which just says it's, it's sensitive. If it has a value, then it means this is the, the number of people who had, um, I believe index month one would be, had the drug in January. It was, was uh, about 13% of people with the outcome, about 11% of people without the outcome. And you can um, order by the value to see what things had the highest coefficient. And we see age comes up, and then we also get smoking and the Charleston index. So these are the things that were positively uh, predictive. If you didn't want to use Shiny to actually view this results, if you wanted to have some local copy, you could press this download button and you'll get a CSV of all the model coefficients uh, and the outcome mean and non-outcome mean for, for all the variables in the model. So that's the first model. We can go back to the summary and look at the same for the second model. So again, if you wanted the settings, you could look in the settings. If you want to look at the performance, everything will get updated for the angiodemia now. You can look at the operating characteristics for different thresholds and these should update. And then you can have a look at discrimination. The rock plot didn't do as well this time, so we weren't able to predict the angioedema quite so well. And the uh, precision recall plot is even like, lower this time, so there would be a lot of false positives if you applied this. Calibration for this model wasn't as great either. So we see here there's a lot more dots that are off the diagonal. Uh, there's wide confidence intervals because it was a, a rarer outcome, so we, we actually had less people uh, to evaluate it on. And then if we look at the demographic plot, we're actually seeing that the ob observed and expected are actually pretty far off each other. Uh, our prediction is much lower than, than what was observed. So this model isn't doing quite so well. If we look at the model itself in this case, we actually had no measurements in this model that were included. Uh, and we, things tend to be uh, less far from the diagonal, so there, was, there were things that were less discriminative in general. And if we look at the values of things that were predictive, we actually found out that, that being black and having a history of angioedemia were the, the top two things that were predictive, which are actually known to be risk factors. So this actually has face validity, this model. But whether you'd want to implement it given its, its performance metrics would depend on, on, on how you intend to apply it. So this is only the start of the journey of patient level prediction. We actually have a standardization set up now where you could pick one of these models to actually do external validation very rapidly. And we were able to show last October that we could do the external validation across many, many sites in, in a few hours or, or less. So we can actually use the standardization now to not only see how well the model performs on one data set, but does it perform consistently across lots of different data sets? And uh, or if it doesn't, what are the patient populations that it doesn't apply very well to? And this means when you're applying these models clinically, you know who they can be applied to. And it should then help answer that question, what is my risk, rather than the population estimate. So with that, I'll hand back to Martin. All right, so um, I will show you some of the, uh, the tools that we've developed specifically for what we call population level effect estimation. So there are actually many ways in which you can use observational data to answer questions of causality. Uh, there are many different designs, um, and actually a lot of them we've implemented in our uh, Odyssey uh, methods library, the R packages. Uh, currently, there's only one that's implemented in Atlas, and so I will show you that one. Um, that design is called the new user cohort method. And so it's a quite simple design where um, you may want to compare two treatments. Uh, one we call the target treatment. So you find all the people that start on the target treatment. Um, and then you define some comparator. And you look at people that start on the comparator treatment. Um, and you just look, well, do I see uh, the outcome of interest occur more often or with a higher rate in, in the target population than in the comparator population? And if this looks very familiar to you, then it's probably because it looks very much like a randomized trial where people are randomized into one or two treatment arms, and you follow people up over time. But of course, this is not a randomized trial because these people aren't randomized into these treatments. And actually, doctors probably have good reasons why they're prescribing one drug to one uh, group of people and the other to the other group of people, meaning that probably these two populations are different to begin with before they ever take the drug. 
And so to account for that in an observational study, you always need some sort of an adjustment strategy. And the typical way to do that is you, you capture uh, all sorts of covariate information on these people prior to initiation of the treatment, and then you form some adjustment strategy. And the typical thing we do is we create a propensity model, which is just a summary of those covariates, um, and we, for example, stratify or match uh, on that uh, propensity score. Now, in this example where we look at hypertension, you could think of the target population maybe being uh, people starting ACE inhibitors, the comparator people starting on thiazide or thiazide-like diuretics. Any outcomes could be actually multiple outcomes. We could look for acute myocardial infarction. We can look for angioedema. And what we also tend, always tend to do is include a large set of negative control outcomes, which are outcomes that we believe in this case are not caused by either ACE inhibitors or thiazide diuretics. And therefore, if we apply the same methods for those negative controls, we would expect to see no effect for those negative controls. And it's a sort of a check to see whether we actually succeeded in, in our adjustment strategy. Now, the way that all of our tools work is they, they build on standard building blocks, um, and those standard building blocks are cohorts. And in this case, we're using four cohorts. One is the cohort of new users of ACE inhibitors. The other is new users of thiazides or thiazide-like diuretics, a cohort of acute myocardial infarction, and a cohort of uh, angioedema. And as you already saw, these are actually the same cohorts that Anthony, for example, used in his characterization study and Jenna used in her prediction uh, studies. So these are reusable objects that you define once and then you can use them uh, in multiple uh, use cases. So I'm gonna also, like Jenna, be adventurous and try the, uh, the live demo. Uh, let me see what are we looking at here. Prediction, oh. estimation. There we go. Maybe I should close your prediction study first. So we have this tool uh, in Atlas called the estimation tool, and it allows you to specify the study, and I'm gonna just go very briefly over this. The main thing to do is, well, you need to define your the, the two things that you're comparing. So we already had the, uh, the cohorts for, um, sorry, here, ACE inhibitors and the cohort for uh, thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. We specify our outcomes, we, um, specify a set of negative controls, and there are some other details that I won't go into. Once we've specified that, oh, nope, this one, this set of um, things that we want to compare, we can specify other settings, like what do we, how do we want to adjust for those differences between the two groups, and I've actually specified four different strategies here. We can use stratification or matching, and I can define an on time, an on, uh, a time at risk window of just when I'm on the treatment, or I can actually just go all the way until observation ends, which is called an intent to treat uh, window. Um, and this basically allows me to fully specify this study with just uh, some, some point, uh, pointing and clicking. Um, one important thing to mention here is that if we use propensity models, we typically tend to uh, include what we call the kitchen sink, which is we just define the largest set of variables that we can think of and throw all of them in a, a lasso uh, regression, which then picks the, the ones that are predictive. The tool also allows you to manually handpick those covariates that you want to uh, put into the model, uh, which other people like to do, but we tend to think that that's not maybe what you should be doing. So just like for patient level prediction, um, in estimation what happens then is in, in Atlas you've defined your study, you can then use Atlas to automatically generate a study R package and you can then send that R package, or you can run it locally if you have data locally, or you can send it across the Odyssey network and have other people execute that package. They can then report the results back, and again, here we have a Shiny app that uh, allows you to view those results, or you can just, of course, analyze the data as it's coming in in some other uh, fashion. So what I wanna do now is I wanna show you that Shiny app, but not specifically the one that's generated by Atlas, but the one that is uh, used in the legend study. It's almost the same, except that it's, the scale is a little bit larger uh, in that instead of just comparing two treatments, as George already mentioned this morning, in Legend we just compare all hypertension treatments. So this is the actual Shiny app that's currently online. Um, I've here already specified, so I've selected from a number of treatments. I'm, I'm going to look at the drug class level, um, not the drug ingredient level. Um, looking at ACE inhibitors, I compared them to thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. Um, 
It's currently set at acute myocardial infarction. That's not really what I was interested in, so let me look for angioedema instead. Um, and as you can see, there are now 55 outcomes that you can choose from. Um, here I see already the results from the, the several databases that we ran this on, including a meta-analysis. But let me just pick the first database, a large uh, US insurance claims database, and see what we see. Well, apart from the fact that we already see that there is a, a hazard ratio that's close to two, but let's ignore that for now. Um, some of the information that's coming back from these sites is, of course, well, how big were these populations? So in the CCE database, we ended up with um, 770, 775,000 new users of angioedema, oh, sorry, of ACE inhibitors as their first line therapy for hypertension, not starting on any, oh, so, oh, so monotherapy, so not starting on any other uh, hypertension treatment. And the same for the thiazide diuretics, where we had uh, a little over 300,000. Uh, we can look at the attrition diagram, so how did we actually end up with that population? Uh, we can look at population characteristics, which is basically using that, using that same module that Anthony was talking about. So um, I can see things like uh, patient characteristics, like age and gender, uh, both before and after I do the stratification on the propensity score. I can actually see the distribution of propensity scores, but in this case, it's telling me that already before adjustment, these populations were, were fairly similar. But I, of course, want to check whether I was successful in making those populations comparable. And so this is showing me all of the uh, close to 9,000 covariates that went into the propensity model. Um, and on the x-axis, I'm showing you the standardized difference before doing the adjustment and on the y-axis after adjustment. And so we see that things like, uh, I think this was gender. Why is there no mouse? Yeah, yeah the mouse up is not. It's probably popping up somewhere else on the screen where I don't see it. But I think like age was before with the adjustment, the, the, the groups differed very much on age. And after adjustment, as you can see there, we've, we've managed to correct for that. Uh, we not only included uh, negative controls with positive but also positive controls. And here we're showing you that we actually did a fairly good job of not finding anything for those negative controls. So for example, uh, well, fairly good. 64.5% of the negative controls actually includes one, the hazard ratio of one inside of the confidence interval. And of course, we would expect 95% of the time that to be the case. So there, there is some residual systematic error and we, we are able to calibrate for that. Uh, we can view the Kaplan-Meier plot. And probably most interesting, uh, we can go to the meta-analysis, look at the forest plot, um, and we see a, a quite consistent effect across all of the databases showing that um, ACE inhibitors lead to an increased risk of angioedema compared to thiazides and thiazide-like diuretics, and actually that's a, a known effect. So just some final thoughts. So sometimes when people hear the word standardization, they think we mean that it's uh, one size fits all. And that's certainly not what we mean by standardization. What we mean is that we have standardized tools where we expose all of the design choices. And you saw in the editor in Atlas that I actually had quite a lot of choices to make there. Um, and the nice thing about these standardized tools is that they're now out in the open and we can discuss uh, these, these decisions um, amongst ourselves. In the end, what this standardization enables is, of course, consistency uh, when we create new studies, transparency on how the, the studies were executed. And I think that's, uh, of course, very much helped by the fact that all of these tools are open source, reproducibility, and last but not least, efficiency. So uh, we were able to implement the study comparing angiodema, uh, ACE inhibitors to thiazide diuretics um, in, I think, under an hour uh, last weekend, just Patrick and me. Um, and that's a full-fledged study that, that we would be perfectly comfortable with uh, reporting in a paper or reporting to the, uh, the regulatory authorities. And with that, I thank you for your attention.